people have been speculating about geothermal for decades at Pilgrim. In the vicinity of the Pilgrim Church, over my shoulder here, a few hundred yards away, there's a, a plume of hot water rising from great depths, you know, many thousands of feet. It gets up to within about 100 feet of the surface, hits an impermeable clay layer, and then spreads out laterally in all directions from the church, like a very thin layer, about uh, maybe as little as 10 feet thick. Other places it might be 30 or 40 feet thick. They're preparing a mud system behind us here right now, and tomorrow we'll be bringing the drill in and starting to actually drill what we hope is going to be a confirmation hole to verify that this resource is capable of generating at least two megawatts of power for delivery to Nome. That's, that's the goal of our work. Everybody in Alaska is pretty much in the same boat. While the Alaska pipeline delivers a lot of fuel to other places in the world, there's only a small amount of it that is used in Alaska. You worry about how you're going to make your next, you know, fuel payment, your electricity in the winter, and anything that we can do to lower that cost would would benefit us greatly. We're bringing in 2.4 million gallons, and the bill for that is 8.3 million. It's three dollars and twenty to three dollars and forty cents a gallon that we're paying for diesel fuel. This project is is key to seeing what's the next step on us developing lower cost or alternative energy for the residents in Nome. And we're really trying to figure out how do we generate energy for the citizens of Nome in a clean and affordable way. And I think this is a long-term solution. This, is, this can generate for generation and generation for your kids, kids, kids. And I think that's exciting to be able to do a long-term solution to energy needs for a community like Nome. To give a little history of, of geothermal development in Alaska and our involvement, the first geothermal power plant operating in the state of Alaska is at Chena Hot Springs in interior Alaska. And I was fortunate enough to be the project engineer and the project manager on developing that particular project. It's the lowest temperature operating geothermal plant anywhere in the world, and it really showed that even though we don't have really high temperature geothermal resources here in Alaska's interior, we do have good cold resources, whether it's cold water or cold air, and that makes it possible to generate meaningful amounts of power even at relatively modest geothermal temperature levels. Power seems to be a big killer. Uh, cost of power. And Bering Straits has recognized that for decades. And the board has continually looked for ways to reduce the cost of living in rural Alaska for its shareholders. Got a great geothermal resource at Pilgrim, and we've engaged in the, the research that's necessary. We found a public partner, a private partner, and we're able to develop a project in a way that solves the needs of the community. And that's good not just for Nome, but it's good for Alaska because it sets an example about how to solve problems instead of just complaining about them. We are in an economic boom. We have a gold rush with the price of gold anywhere from 12 to 1600 an ounce. We're the only community in the state of Alaska where there's lease cells for mining activities in state waters. So we've seen an increase in dredging. In 1990, there were four dredges. Last year, we had over 88 with 20 support vessels, three research vessels on top of our healthy fishing fleet. One of the most remarkable pieces about developing Pilgrim Hot Springs as an energy resource is how quickly it came together. Most regions, their population is moving away because the price of energy is so expensive to live. We're in a unique position because of the economic boom that we're having. The cost of living is pretty expensive here. With this project, by being able to lower the cost of energy, we're hoping that new businesses will continue to stay or grow, folks will be able to spend their money instead of not all on energy. They'll be able to shift their funds to different opportunities.
When we looked at the data, we really thought that there was some potential with improved technology, with the new things that we know about developing low temperature and moderate temperature geothermal systems like the power plant at China Hot Springs. We thought that this could potentially be developable on the kind of scale that would benefit the region. Once we made the determination in February that we were going to start developing Pilgrim, what we had to do was find someone to do the drilling. We had to put the drill rigs on a barge. We had to find the money to pay for all this. We had to orchestrate the ongoing research that was necessary. We had to make sure that we had a private developer in place. And we did that within three months. And that's an incredible story in and of itself. The university, the city of Nome, the Nome Chamber of Commerce, Bering Straits Native Corporation, and Unaktek are all working together to see that this happens and we're all taking a risk but we're all also very excited to see this project move forward. We were able to receive funds through the Alaska Energy Authority and the Department of Energy to do an exploration effort here at the site. That's a very high-risk venture and there's real potential that it wouldn't be successful. But for the community of Nome, this could make a really big difference. Nome could move toward 100% diesel off at at least portions of the year, and that would be pretty exciting. Yeah, what we've seen so far, comparing 2012 and 2013 data against 1979 and 1982 data, is that there have been some changes in the very shallow parts of the field, but the deeper parts here have largely remained unchanged in the last 31 years. In the shallow part here, we've had the wells flowing now for the hot tubs that hadn't been flowing prior to 1982. Some changes like that are expected. The deeper changes, they're much harder to see and much harder to create because the geothermal system is a very massive piece of the earth here that's got a lot of BTUs or heat stored in it, a lot of water stored in it, and to change that, you have to make big changes in the system. You have to flow wells at a high rate for a long time to impact something that large. Okay, that's the road back to Nome. About an hour and a half, two hours. And that's facing east and then turning to this direction is the road back to Pilgrim Hot Springs. Uh, we know that there definitely is some resource up there and are hoping that work that is currently ongoing will determine that it's economically viable to pipe that power to us. This is what we are about now to come test with the new well. It's going to be much larger diameter and flowed at a far, far higher rate, 10 times what any of these others have flowed, to stress the system to see how it responds, how much water might be there, and how fast the recharge is to the part of the system we are going to stress. Developing a power plant at Pilgrim is only a small part of the equation. It's 60 miles away, and so we need a transmission line to come into it. And that certainly is a dramatic variable in the economics of this. We need pretty much certainty that the resource is available before there's the potential for investment to actually export it and bring it into town. Right now, the state of Alaska is subsidizing the power cost for residential users up to 500 kilowatt hours. It's called the Power Cost Equalization Program, and that's a way to reduce to some degree the burden for high-cost communities in the state that are served primarily by diesel generation. As we start to see state dollars decline, investing the dollars that we do have in infrastructure that can serve not just the current residents, but also future residents of this community are really the thing that we need to be doing with the limited state dollars that we have available. Developing a project like Pilgrim Hot Springs here is something that could be benefiting this community for many decades and even centuries to come. The main question we have is where does it come out of the bedrock? Where is that hole? Where's the crack? where it comes out of the bedrock. And second is, how does it get from there to the springs? It's a puzzle and we're trying to understand how things are happening below ground where we can't really see them. Because you have many springs on the surface, 
and we hypothesize that there is one major crack that transports the heat. And so that heat is just going all directions. We haven't actually been able to, to pinpoint that exact place where the hot water is coming up from some kind of a crack or a fracture in the bedrock. We find hot water at 1,000 feet. We find hot water at 100 feet. But in between, we find cold water. And so that's kind of a mystery. <laughs> The goal is to find that spot, because once we find it and we can find a crack that is underneath it, where the heat comes from, then we can pump directly from the bedrock system. After three seasons of investigation out at this site, there's some things that we're fairly confident about. One is the temperature of the water. Our hottest temperatures that we've measured is about 91 Celsius. It's just a little bit below boiling in several different locations out there, both at near the surface and, and deeper in the holes. We also know from geochemistry, so looking at the ratios of different elements in the thermal fluids, that the, the water's been quite a bit hotter than that at depth, but we haven't actually accessed those temperatures. We know now, okay, it's a deeper circulating system and there are these major faults going through the valley, right? And so why would the water come up only in one place? The thinking is that, okay, if there is an extensive web of cracks, it's more likely that the system is a lot bigger than we think. What I did for the program was came up with new and cheap exploration tools. I myself work with satellite remote sensing. That means looking at the surface from satellites or from airborne platforms from the top. We used a technology called forward-looking infrared systems. And these are cameras that map the temperature of the ground and see where the area is hot. So she is looking at those temperatures on the ground surface and correcting it for atmospheric conditions. But what really is useful for us is when we fly our own aircrafts over this area, or we have unmanned aerial vehicles that we fly over the area, and then they can hover down pretty low. And when we put our camera systems on that and our thermal cameras on that, we can map this at very high detail. When I say very high detail, on the right, is a blue, green, red photograph. It's like a camera photograph. And the left one is from the forward-looking infrared that's showing the high temperatures in yellows and whites. These are both taken from aircraft. And aircraft flying about at the height of one kilometer from the ground. I do almost the same thing from, from below, so in, in the ground. So I'm using data and models in order to figure out how much heat is coming to the surface. How we analyze the data for any area, it's not just a plug and play, that, that you just go, you get the data, and here you've got your results. It doesn't work like that. We say, this is the point in the ground. We have exactly the same point on the photograph, so it matches really well. That is very, very important. And to do that, we have onboard GPS systems, and also what we call a navigation system on aircrafts and on uh, unmanned aerial systems, which tell you how much was the aircraft moving when the picture was being taken. So once we have those, every image frame, every frame, and we have thousands of image frame, when we have them corrected, we mosaic them. And when we mosaic them, we get a good, big, kind of a map product. And that map product actually is like a mosaic, what we call orthorectified map product. And from that, we've got our data set. They are correct in their spatial location. And then from that, we derive our information. In an ideal world, this would, of course, match up. So you get not just what's coming out of the surface, but also how did it get to the surface. And this animation shows imagery from Anupma. And the image is rotating. So you can start seeing the below ground parts, the parts that we have data for. And you see the dots with different colors indicating the amount of clay particles in the ground. And clay particles tend to reduce the amount of water that moves through the ground. 
Clay particles are very often present as a capping rock or a capping mechanism for geothermal systems. And so hot water that rises to the surface accumulates under these caps. If you look closely underneath the surface, you'll see a very dense clay layer where most of that hot water is kept under. But deeper down in the surface, you see more areas of clay or the presence of clay particles. You also see the boreholes that are drilled over the years. The colors indicate the temperatures. The hotter temperatures in the reds and the cooler temperatures in the blue. And as you look carefully at the wells, you see that this blue layer is kind of continuous all the way across because we haven't found exactly the place where the hot water comes up. And that is the big challenge. As scientists, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting puzzle, it's an interesting challenge to have just a few pieces of information and trying to form a full understanding of how something is happening. And the good thing about this is that we are using Pilgrim Hot Spring as a test case to look at low temperature geothermal resources. And this is, this is a very data rich area, so if we can do it right here, then in other areas where we do not have so much funding to go and do detailed investigation, this could be an exploration tool which is pretty low cost. What we've recommended as we transfer this project to private sector is that they drill one additional temperature gradient hole in an area we haven't been able to get to uh, due to logistical limitations. You have a hole that's a thousand feet deep, and that's a, that's a long way to go. So as you're lowering a probe that weighs a couple pounds more or less into the well, you need a way to determine how deep that probe is, and a way to easily lower and raise it back up out of the well. What that spool of wire does is it's also got a counter on the front of it. It allows you to easily see exactly how deep that probe is that you're lowering into the well. It's just an easy way to raise and lower that probe into the well. At Pilgrim Hot Springs, the first drilling actually happened in 1979, where two wells were drilled down to about 150 feet in depth. And then in 1982, I believe four more wells were drilled to deeper depths. The temperature and the pressure in those wells was measured back then, but nothing was really done with those wells until we reopened them in 2011. This is getting to be a good valve now. The wellheads were actually rusted shut, so we had to take off those old wellheads and old rusty valves, and we put new stainless steel valves on top of those. And what that allows us to do is actually open up the valves, and we can drop our different probes and instruments down those wells to see how the readings have changed over time. If things are cooling or things are warming. And it's actually been kind of interesting because certain wells have changed temperatures just a little bit, but for the most part, the temperatures haven't changed too much out there. ASAP took the lead role in providing the research that was necessary to understand the resource so we could develop it and, and serve the people of the community and the people of the region. And without ASAP, this would never have happened. It's an impressive system out there. When you're drilling a well, number one, you've got to have a way to get those cuttings that are being chipped up by that drill bit deep underground. You've got to have a way to get those cuttings back to the surface. And so that drilling mud, that is constantly being pumped down into the well through the drill bit and then it's coming back up to the surface and it's collected in a series of tanks. The shale shaker allows the drilling mud to flow through the fine mesh that vibrates and any drill cuttings that are collected are sorted out of that drilling mud and then put in a separate tank. That way you can keep recirculating your mud and you don't have to put new mud in every time. The other thing that drilling mud does is it provides something called hydrostatic pressure. If you can imagine digging a hole at the beach, you know, you usually get to a couple feet deep and then all of a sudden your hole will collapse, you know, and any, any six-year-old who's ever played at the beach can tell you this. What drillers have to do is they have to find a way that they can keep drilling down and their hole is not going to collapse on their drill string because otherwise they lose their drill string and their bit. So when you pump mud and you circulate that mud through your hole, it creates a slight outward pressure so that that hole doesn't want to collapse. That mud is made up of 
stuff called bentonite clay, and it forms what's called a wall cake on the outside of that hole, which adds hole stability so that hole doesn't collapse while they keep drilling deeper and deeper. And Gwen has been a wonder to work with. Without her, I don't think we would have gotten to this point. Geothermal is basically the only renewable power that, that can be used as a base load. You'd never do this in lower 48 because you never have the same conditions you do here. I mean, with the super high cost of electricity, it makes you know, a 50 mile power line actually feasible. In the geothermal community, my reputation has really been solidified by working on the Chena Hot Springs project and being associated with the power generation project there, which is about 40 degrees lower in temperature than any other commercial geothermal project in the world at 165 Fahrenheit. The biggest diameter hole that was drilled this past fall was a 22-inch diameter hole. When you're drilling a hole of that size, you're not just going to drill a 22-inch hole right away. You usually start about a six or a nine inch hole and then you might expand to a 12 inch hole and then to a, a 14 or a six inch hole and then finally to a 22 inch hole. Gwen was fantastic in keeping that enthusiasm going and keeping the resources rolling and just a positive spirit around the whole project. It's amazing how much more you work when the environment is positive and so that's that's also a very big strength of this whole project and Looking at actually an application that gives back to the community is very satisfying, I think. So that's, that's one more big thing about the project that I wanted to say. The stuff that they were using out there, it looked big, but it's hard to really get a feel for how heavy and how substantial that stuff is until you're actually there and you actually try and pick up a wrench that they use. Because some of these wrenches that they were feeding onto their drill string to break them apart, could easily weigh 50 or 70 pounds, you know, and it's inch and a half steel. It's a really, really substantial piece of equipment and safety is a huge thing out there. Everybody's constantly wearing hard hats and trying to keep track of each other to be very careful about all their movements as they're moving around the drill rig. Drillers don't like to leave that big long drill string with the bit on the end of it in their hole while they're not actually drilling. Therefore, we were drilling 24 hours a day and there was two 12-hour shifts, three guys on the drill team per shift. It was going constantly. The situation here is very different than in Iceland in that in Iceland they have a national electric grid and everything's connected to the grid. So of course you wouldn't develop a project like the Pilgrim or the China Hot Springs project if you had a big grid and had access to other kinds of much lower cost energy sources like hydropower or maybe natural gas generation. But because these are islanded grids, it's a completely different situation. You don't have anything other than the on-site diesel generation to serve many of these sites. And so it's a completely different economic challenge. There will always be diesel powerhouses out in rural Alaska, but if you could turn them from being your prime source of electricity to something that you turn on in an emergency, that'd be really good. There's a lot of money to be saved and a whole economy that could change. And on the GNOME side, we've also been looking at what does it actually mean for them to incorporate two megawatts of geothermal? How does that interact with their wind farm? How does that interact with their existing diesel generators and the things that they're doing today? I think the city and the utility are very interested in the potential of Pilgrim Hot Springs coming on board. If we could get a good base load coming out of there that could help us with the removal of some of the diesel use and then also provide a buffer for us when the wind does not blow, it just would be a hybrid system there that would be of great benefit to the community. What do the economics of power production out of this resource look like? I mean, what should the cost of power be? Does this seem to make any sense? 
it's relatively unusual to have a relatively small amount of power, two megawatts or so, support on the order of 60 miles of transmission line into Nome. When you manage to find a solution to turn your diesels completely off, there are much more savings to be had than just a displaced fuel. If you look at the mix of costs that are flowing into the cost per kilowatt hour produced from a diesel generator, then only 40 to 50 percent of the costs are fuel costs. The rest are operation and maintenance costs. The first thing that I did when I was brought into the project was to try to understand whether there was an economic project here or not. When I first looked at this, I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense at all. I can't figure out how this hunts. Then I realized the reason why it works is right now, substantially, is because there are federal income tax credits which are available for the production of geothermal energy. And they're also expiring. Developing a power plant at Pilgrim is only a small part of the equation. It's 60 miles away, and so we need a transmission line to come into it. That certainly is a dramatic variable in the economics of this. We need pretty much certainty that you know, the resource is available before there's the potential for investment to actually export it and bring it into town. What's unusual about this project for Alaska is that we have a private developer, Pilgrim Geothermal LLC, interested in picking up the project and moving it forward, where that's really the lion's share of the investment dollars, something like $40 million needs to be spent from here moving forward. For that private investment to occur, the investor needs to know, well, if I spend a bunch of money, am I sure that you're gonna buy my power? and the surety is provided by the power purchase agreement with the Nome utility. So Nome bound itself to agree, yeah, up to two megawatts of power that you produce and deliver to me, I'll take it at this price. And so that step has taken place. It's probably one of the largest power purchase agreements that's ever been made in the state of Alaska between a private developer and a public body, in this case, the city of Nome. That's why getting this power purchase deal was a big deal. The project needed it to get in place so that the private investor had not only security, but security in a timely way to continue to make progress in the development of that project. I think a lot of times we think of ourselves as being too small and too remote with too small of community bases to be able to attract private sector financing to contribute to these kinds of large scale projects. And so I'm really hoping that Pilgrim Hot Springs can demonstrate that there are ways that we can attract private dollars into the state, that we can be using public dollars to fund some of the higher risk exploration work. And then we can try to figure out ways to find really positive relationships between private sector and communities and Nome has really, I think, pioneered this kind of thing where they have more than one now independent power producer. No, this would be the second one that they have on their grid that they're purchasing power from. And that's something that is unusual in this state. And I think that it's really something that needs to be looked at a little bit more as a way to provide new potential capital and new potential options for generating power in a really sustainable manner long term for some of these communities in Alaska.